G'day guys and gal. It's common knowledge that I think pretty much all the traitor Primarchs and their legions fall to chaos are quite stupid. Daddy issues, premature boldness, inferiority complex, or just being an idiot are some of the main causes of the traitor Primarchs fall. You would expect these to be the reason why a 9 year old would knock over their little cousins at Lego Castle, not the cause of demigod super beans giving their soul away to some very evil looking deities. A lot of people are like, oh, what a tragedy that Mortarion fell, oh, oh no Magnus, he was such a swell guy before he pledged his soul to the forces of hell. No, shut up. Mortarion made a stupid hypocritical decision derived from his dad saving his life slash healing his kill years earlier, whilst Magnus didn't listen to the rules and then acted like a dumbass afterwards. The only real tragedy that has any weight to it is the tragedy of the fall of Fulgrim, the son that was never meant to fall yet fell the hardest. More on that later. Before we get started, you guys are always asking about what music I use for my videos. I used to tell you, but now I just can't be bothered, so I've come up with a solution and also a new cool way for you guys and gal to get involved in the videos. Myself and pretty much every other YouTuber on the planet uses a website called Epidemic Sounds, who have thousands of copyright free songs, so I was thinking that if I made a playlist and invite you guys to add songs to that playlist, I could then use those songs you guys recommend to me in some of my future videos. Here's how it will work. Epidemic Sound challenged me to get 10 people to sign up as paying subscribers, so 15 bucks a month. And if I do, they will consider making me a brand ambassador, which means it opens up a huge revenue stream for the channel. But Major Kill, why do we give a shit about you and your revenue streams? Stop being a Jew- Silence your prejudiced mouth, Timmy, before I force you to sign up to Epidemic Sounds. Basically, the more money Major Kill makes, the more hentai artists he can pay, the more animations that get produced, and the more videos that come out. On top of that, the people who sign up to Epidemic Sound using my link will be the people who get to add the songs to the Major Kill playlist and have their favourite songs featured. Epidemic Sound themselves are basically essential for anyone who seeks to be a content creator in any form, or just wants to download some awesome tracks. Referral link will be in the description and comments below. Today we will discuss who the Empress children are and what their origins are, as well as their role in the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy. We will also take a deep dive into the lore of their Primarch Fulgrim. After that, we will discuss what they're currently up to, as well as some of their more fun characters, such as everyone's favourite skin-wearing mad scientist, Fabius. I also do want to talk about why Fulgrim's fall was the only one that was actually tragic, and why it was never supposed to happen. Let's get into it. In the Warhammer universe, there is a lot of cheek clapping, metaphorically and physically. The master of the art of the cheek clap was none other than a humble man that went by the name of THE GOD EMPEROR OF MANKIND. He decided that the galaxy was just one big pair of cheeks that needed to be clapped, hence he created 20 demigod babies called Primarchs. The gods of chaos, and slash all the Primarchs mum, weren't super keen on 20 demigods running around clapping everyone's cheeks, hence the infant Primarchs were scattered across the galaxy. Some Primarchs landed on planets filled with books and became nerds. Some Primarchs landed on religious planets and got molested by their dads. Fulgrim landed on a shitty dying world called Chemos. It was rich in natural resources, but poor in anything you actually need to survive, such as food. Because of this, the world had everyone working around the clock just to keep it alive, with population control and rationing being the name of the game. There was absolutely no time for pleasure or arts. This is interesting as it provides an argument towards the fact that the Primarchs were barely affected by their surroundings as they grow up, and would have turned out as they did regardless of their upbringing, as Fulgrim would turn out to be one of those weird arts kids, despite growing up in what can be compared to Chernobyl. In saying that though, we have Russ, who was raised by wolves and now has wolf fangs for some reason. Fulgrim would have a pretty unexciting childhood as he quickly grew to his massive size and overhauled the world's technology, greatly improving it to where Chemos was producing a surplus of resources and everything didn't suck as much. The planet itself was terraformed, in body and spirit, becoming a vibrant hub of nature and the arts. No longer was it Chernobyl, now it was just like Melbourne. Just as Fulgrim ascended to its leader, the Big E came, and before he could give Fulgrim his usual spiel, Fulgrim instantly declared his loyalty to the man who he would call Daddy. While this is occurring, the Third Legion had emerged as a noble force to be reckoned with, as they lead parts of the Imperial Army in the unification of Terra. They would soon become the Big E's favourite toys, as, through great personal sacrifice, they were able to protect the Emperor from an ambush. However, this would be their last real action until the discovery of Fulgrim. See, there was a bit of an incident and a lot of their gene seed was destroyed. This would have been okay if it weren't for the fact that the rest of their gene seed then got infected with AIDS and was rendered unusable and defective. 
Hence the 3rd Legion, without their Primarch, could no longer create new Space Marines. After a couple more years, their Legion had been decimated to only 200 Astartes. Gee, it's like some unknown force saw what the 3rd Legion would become and was like, nope, fuck that, and bent time and space to destroy them. With the reunification of Fulgrim and his sons, their GNC crisis had been averted. Despite this though, there was only still 200 Marines, so not exactly a useful fighting force yet. Fulgrim saw those 200 sons of his with pride, and he gave such a good speech to them that the Emperor allowed them to call his legion the Emperor's children, and also exclusively carry the Imperial Aquila in recognition for their sacrifice, and because also Fulgrim was a good son. Now here's the thing. I'm in the camp that believes that the Emperor knew that a number of his sons would betray him, and that he had a general idea who would and who wouldn't, based on which planet they landed on. It was confirmed that Fulgrim and Jagadai Khan had their planet swapped by the Laughing God without the Emperor's knowledge, hence the Emperor was suspicious of the Khan but trusted Fulgrim enough to allow him and his legion to basically represent him. The Big E is a memer for sure, but even I don't think he would give such a high honour to the legion who would end up tongue-fucking their own shit for pleasure. Not the best look, you know. Fulgrim and his Pindic Legion would be assigned to Horus and his Lunar Wolves, fighting side by side and forming a pretty solid bond over the course of a decade, a bond which would go pretty south for Fulgrim down the track. Eventually enough GNC was produced for the Empress children that they were able to rebuild their numbers and strike out on their own, conquering dozens of worlds for the Imperium. They were still a bit behind in numbers, so they weren't really the top dogs of the Great Crusade, but they did their job pretty well. During this time, Fulgrim formed another bond, Ferris Manus, Primarch of the Iron Hands. Fulgrim and Ferris could not have been more different. Fulgrim wore purple and pink armor and played with Barbie dolls. Ferris built motorbikes and had silver hands. Despite their differences, they soon found each other measuring dick sizes as to who could forge the greatest weapon. After three months of non-stop forging, each Primarch had created an instrument of war. Fulgrim had made a dope-ass warhammer and Ferris had made a flaming sword. Despite their competitive spirit, they declared the other the winner and swapped weapons, forming a brotherhood that would end horrifically. Pretty much everything Fulgrim did ended horrifically, but this was like double horrific. Throughout the Great Crusade, this competitive spirit would turn ugly, as the Emperor's children felt a lot of pressure to be perfect. They would copy and attempt to improve on any battle tactic they witnessed, often falling short due to them trying to be the best at everything, hence becoming the best at nothing. Many of them became narcissistic pricks who were never satisfied. This wasn't too much of a problem at the time, but was about to be. Eventually, Fulgrim and his pimps discovered the Lair, a planet full of genetically modified serpents dedicated to Slaanesh. At the time, none of the Primarchs really knew about Chaos, so they just assumed that the Lair's excessive orgies were a natural part of their reproductive cycle. Either way, the Lair were crushed by the Empress children, with Fulgrim eventually finding their main temple. In it was a sword which screamed, don't touch me, I am very evil. But Fulgrim pulled an Arthas and touched the evil sword anyways. So began the fall of Fulgrim. The sword had a demon in it. The marines fighting on the planet also experienced varying levels of corruption as the planet was borderline a demon world. All the remembrances who traveled to the planet to record it all ended up going insane and killing themselves or each other in horrific ways. The Layer Blade, as it was called, began to speak to Fulgrim and encourage him to be a massive dick which he just shrugged off as being his own subconscious talking to him. It got to a point where Fulgrim was saved by Ferris from some powerful Xenos, who then jokingly mocked Fulgrim as brothers do. Yet Fulgrim took the saving as the Iron Hands one-upping him, and the mocking as a personal attack on his honor. Fulgrim had gone for a shining example of everything good about humanity to a whiny little bitch, all because he grabbed a sword which looked like an oversized dildo. Where does that sneaky little biggie wannabe Fabius come into all of this? Fabius sucked from day one. His first act was to discover how to detect the virus that infected the Emperor's children gene seed, hence all those infected were mercy killed. Fabius discovered that he himself was also infected, but decided to frame his results on a healthy marine and had them executed in his stead, as he considered himself too important. This self-importance would actually make Fabius somewhat amusingly likeable, and despite being super evil, he actually rejected chaos and was a devout atheist. Like, demons near Fabius felt physical pain and how much he didn't believe in them. He embodied the Emperor's children's fatal flaw of wanting to be a perfectionist, constantly experimenting on various humans and Xenos, modifying them to make them stronger or just for gags. Before the Horus Heresy kicked off, however, Fabius spent most of his time trying to cure himself. He was able to extend his life via machinery, medicine, and finally by cloning Gene Seed and replacing his dead ones with it. 
but his condition was terminal and had only a year left to live by the time the heresy kicked off. Despite being an atheist, like every single traitor in Warhammer, he was also a hypocrite. He genetically modified the other Emperor's children, doing stuff like giving them extra nostrils to rail more cocaine with, or giving them curved dicks so they could fuck their anasses mid-combat, but never gave himself any of these surgeries because, you know, they were horrific. The first main surgery he gave was implanting a layer vocal cord into Lord Commander Eildon, who was a pretentious dick, giving him the ability to scream like an annoying bitch and kind of creating the first noise marine. Eventually Horus went full bold cunt mode and turned against the Emperor. Eldrad, being one of the only people with common sense in the entire galaxy, rushed to Fulgrim to warn him of this event. At the time, the Emperor's children and Fulgrim were considered one of the most noble and loyal legions. No one knew how messy it was behind closed doors. Eldrad was like, yo dude, you have hair so you must be loyalist. Your brother Horus is a traitor, just, just thought I'd let you know. And Fulgrim just started autistically screeching and attacked Eldrad. To Eldrad's credit, him and his warriors were able to kill all of Fulgrim's Phoenix Guard and most of his warriors, whilst Fulgrim killed Eldrad's Wraith Lord and an avatar of Cain. This is probably one of the stupidest things in lore, but basically Fulgrim saw that the Avatar was eyeing off his layer blade because, you know, Slanesh bad. So Fulgrim threw it in the air, and whilst the Avatar looked up at it, Fulgrim punched the shit out of the Avatar and then choked him to death. Which just makes no sense, like Fulgrim was not the punchy Primarch, and the Avatars of Cain are covered in molten metal, and don't require oxygen. Hence Fulgrim should have been burnt really bad, and the Avatar shouldn't have tapped out from just being choked, but whatever. Fulgrim then virus bombed a bunch of Eldar Maiden worlds for lols before going off to confront Horus. He was like, Horus, have you dared to betray our father, our glorious overlord, the best dude ever? And Horus was like, yes. Chaos is way cooler. And Fulgrim was like, okay, no worries. Lamau. Hence Fulgrim was now a traitor. The tragedy of Fulgrim begins to take shape here, as there were multiple times throughout these events where Fulgrim tried to beat Slanesh. When fighting the Avatar of Cain, the sword called to him and he tried to resist it. When Eldrad told him of Horus' betrayal, it was the layer blade which pushed him to attack the Eldar. When Horus admitted his betrayal, Fulgrim considered blowing up Horus' ship and just ending the heresy right there, but the sword pushed him not to. Fulgrim would then be sent to chat to Ferris and try bring him over to Horus, which went pretty badly as Ferris instantly attacked Fulgrim, but was knocked out by an explosion when he broke Fulgrim's sword. Not the layer blade, the one he made for Fulgrim. Fulgrim was finally able to resist the demon momentarily and not kill his unconscious brother, but it was too little too late. About one third of each of the traitor legions were not psychopaths, hence they would have rejected their Primarch's open rebellion. For the Emperor's children, it was pretty easy to tell who of this one third would have been. Pretty much anyone who wasn't a drug addict. To deal with this, the Traitor Legions deployed all the Loyalist forces within them onto Istvan to attack a Traitor planet that had been corrupted by Slanesh. After some fighting, the planet was virus bombed, however due to the bravery of the Emperor's Children Commander Sol Tarvitz, most of the Loyalists survived and they were able to hold against the Traitors for months. See when that Dick Eildon refused to lead the charge during the final assault, Sol was instantly suspicious. Eildon was the cockiest dude ever and would never deny a chance to lead the victory charge. As such, an extremely badass dreadnought called Rylanor took Sol's place. More on Rylanor later, as he is a really awesome character who spits in the face of Fulgrim. Sol discovers that the planet is about to be virus bombed, but instead of gathering loyalists to him and fleeing, he instead warned the loyalist Death Guard commander Nathaniel Garo, who was also his sworn honor brother, allowing him to warn the Imperium, and he flew to the planet's surface to get his brothers to safety. After months of holding off against the traitors, Sol kicked Ildin's ass, but was betrayed by Lucius, another Emperor's children, Dick, who honestly just needs to fucking die at this point. Horus then finished off Sol and the other loyalists by orbitally bombing their final defensive positions. Coward. This kind of bravery by Sol was what the Emperor's children were before the Layer Blade. At some point during this time, one of the remembrances who visited Leia was a musician and got really, really corrupted. She created twisted songs based off what she heard from the Leia Temple, and performed them for Fulgrim and some of his Astartes and other mortal crewmen. Well, it went pretty poorly, or well, depending on your desired result, as the song drove everyone into a crazed blood orgy. The musician and her band got possessed by demons and joined in on the fun, obviously dying pretty quick as a DJ is no match for a power fist. Some of the Empress children tried to play their musical instruments after the musicians had all died, and instead fired shockwaves, 
creating the first cluster of noise marines. After some time, the Iron Hands, Raven Guard, and Salamanders arrived on Isvan to face off against the Emperor's Children, Sons of Horus, and World Eaters. The fighting was intense, especially from the Iron Hands who were enraged by Fulgrim's betrayal. Eventually, the Night Lords, Word Bearers, Iron Warriors, and Alpha Legion arrived to support the Loyalists. Hence, while the Salamanders and Raven Guard withdrew to their newly arrived allies, the Iron Hands were like, nah, fuck ya, and charged at Fulgrim head on. Ferris and Fulgrim entered into a duel. Ferris was way stronger than Fulgrim, but Fulgrim was faster. But with the layer blade bullshit cheese, Fulgrim was able to gain strength hacks, and he disarmed Ferris. Just before the killing blow, Fulgrim stopped and realized what a piece of shit him and his legion had become. He realized how far he had fallen, and that this is not what he wanted. But this moment of weakness allowed the demon to momentarily take control of his arms, and swing the layer blade, decapitating Ferris. Fulgrim then went full depressed specs, and the demon used this even greater weakness to take full control of Fulgrim, making him just the meat suit for a decent amount of time. To make matters worse, the evil Batman, Pedos, Iron Dickheads, and We Are Alpharius unsurprisingly turned out to be traitors and opened fire on the retreating Raven Guard and Salamanders, completing the Istvan drop site massacre. When Horus found out about Fulgrim being possessed, he was horrified. All of the traitor Primarchs were, even Lorgar. See, Horus' pitch to get people to go evil wasn't, hey guys, let's all spread our cheeks to the Lords of Hell and let them anally eviscerate us. No one is happy with how it all turned out. Do you think Mortarion wanted to be a moth? Now here is where the tragedy of Fulgrim ends. Not because Fulgrim dies or because he is redeemed, no, he just goes full spaz mode. You would have thought that Fulgrim regretting everything at that last moment, getting the demon out of Fulgrim would mean Fulgrim would turn to the light, but no. See, Fulgrim actually got the demon out of him pretty quickly. However, his time spent possessed made him realize that being a horrible sadistic rapist was actually quite cool. He did, however, continue to pretend to be possessed as a test to some of his Astartes. Stuff like being a dick, being bad at sword fighting and relying on psychic powers drove Lucius, that dick, to capture Fulgrim and torture him as a way of trying to get the demon out. After a solid session of torture-based exorcism, in which Fulgrim actually enjoyed himself quite a lot, Lucius realized that Fulgrim wasn't actually possessed, and Fulgrim was just trying to meme him. After this elaborate ruse, Fulgrim decided that he wanted to be a demon prince, aka an oversized rape snake. One good thing from Fulgrim being possessed, however, was that he decapitated that dick Ilden, and then stitched his head back on, resulting in Ilden being in constant agony, as well as severely mentally retarded. To do this, he attempted to murder his brother Petrabo. See, Fulgrim hadn't really been sticking to Horus' plan. When Horus directed him towards Mars, he instead attacked a random Mechanicus world in order to acquire their glass, which made really nice mirrors. I'm not even joking for once. The Iron Warriors were some of the most disciplined and powerful of Horus' allies. They were easily one of the most important traitor legions, so for Fulgrim to try and murder their Primarch just so he could get a tail was pretty demented. When Fulgrim arrived to see his brother, Perti was shocked to see the Emperor's children disembark from their ships, in no formation, their armor completely twisted and all of them covered in horrific augmentations from their surgeries and drug use. Fulgrim convinced Perti to follow him into the Eye of Terror to uncover an Eldar artifact. Fulgrim then pulled a fast one and tried to drain Perti's life from him in order to trigger his ascension, but due to Iron Hand intervention, it just didn't happen. Fulgrim then ascended anyways, just cause. Maybe I should say descended because pumping a demon prone actually kinda sucks. Like your soul is removed and replaced with lots of warp spaghetti. When the traitors eventually attacked Terra, the Emperor's children decided that they couldn't be bothered actually fighting, and instead began raping, pillaging, and snorting their way through Terra's civilian population. Like Fabius even grounded down a million prisoners into powder that the Emperor and children snorted. That is canon lore. Horus fights the Emperor, Emperor kills Horus, Emperor becomes a quadriplegic and a massive strain on the healthcare system, and the traitors fall back to the Eye of Terra after getting mercilessly hunted. The Emperor's children were despised by even the other traitor legions. A, because pink is gay and chaos is homophobic, and B, the Emperor's children enjoy kidnapping and stealing from other traitor legions. The Emperor's children are pretty useless at this time, however, as Fulgrim didn't care about them. They're too insane to employ any good tactics. They got smashed by the other legions, and then Abaddon kicked their ass when Fabius stole Horus's body and cloned him. Fulgrim was able to slit Gulliman's throat in a duel, however, putting him in stasis. Karma would come for Fulgrim with the return of the Dreadnought Rylanor. In his Dreadnought armor, he was able to survive Istvan and the years since, however, he was stranded. He led out a beacon to the Empress' children and Fulgrim personally answered it, accompanied by some thousand sons. 
Fulgrim found Rylanor, who then tried to detonate a nuclear bomb in his face to kill him in revenge for the Istvan atrocity. However, the Thousand Sons were able to use their nerd powers to keep the bond from exploding. This next part is one of my favourite things in the lore. Fulgrim, being Fulgrim, starts taunting Rylanor and pulls him out of his Dreadnought, before insinuating he would twist his body and mind through thorough molestation. The Thousand Sons guiding Fulgrim were so disgusted by Fulgrim's actions and so impressed with Rylanor's bravery that they just let the nuke go off and kill all of them. Fulgrim ends up banished, being a demon prince, but imagine being so despised that your own allies happily die so you get inconvenienced. Fulgrim has spent the last 10,000 years in the Eye of Terror jerking off somewhere. The pitiful remains of his own legion are unsure where he is at now. The Empress children haven't had many stories created of them as they suffer the same issue as the World Eaters. They're too batshit crazy to be enjoyable. The only Empress children Astartes that gets his own books and stories is Fabius, who has been able to survive the Blight by cloning himself and then transferring his consciousness into the clones when his cancer reaches critical levels. Fabius doesn't even consider himself part of his legion anymore, so for all intents and purposes, the Empress children are dead, with only a few warbands scattered around. A really cool plot point which got created but then ignored was Fabius creating a perfect loyalist clone of Fulgrim. I have a theory about why the Fulgrim clone was the only one that was considered perfect, but I'll explain that in a different video. The Fulgrim clone was free of the layer blade and despite having the same memories as Snake Fulgrim, was disgusted in his actions and loyal to the Emperor, showing us that it was the demonic corruption that turned Fulgrim, not just the fact that he was a douchebag. Sadly, that plotline got binned as Fabius sold Clonegrim to everyone's favourite Pokemon collector, Trans the Infinite. With the return of Gulliman, Fulgrim is awoken and looks pretty keen to put the G-Man back to bed permanently, but so far the Emperor's children haven't done anything because, you know, they're useless. Fabius has continued his experiments, stealing stuff like the blood of Sanguinius as well as getting excited about the new Primaris Marines and their genetic bounty. Interestingly enough, it appears that the Laughing God has his eyes on Fabius, and the prospect of Fabius becoming a bit of an anti-hero is emerging. I'm a sucker for anti-heroes, so I do hope this is explored. However, knowing the Emperor's children, any interesting plotlines that emerge will usually get instantly binned. And that does us for today, guys. The lore and story of the Empress children in Fulgrim. I don't really care much about Demon Fulgrim, but the concept of Fulgrim being active in both a loyalist and traitor form simultaneously is really cool and exciting. An encounter between the two would be legendary. It's not a Slaneshi themed video unless I plug my hentai filled Patreon. For only $1 a month, you can get access to a boatload of Wyoming hentai, as well as support the channel. The Major Kill hentai calendar is nearly done as well, so get keen for that. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.